There you go. Okay, greetings everyone. It's Corey Harris here with Five Points International Interview Series. This week, we're very pleased to be blessed with the presence of Piedmont Blues, Benedict and Valerie Turner. Greetings. Hello. Greetings. greetings. Good morning. How are y'all doing? We are doing well. We hope that you are well. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. A little, little chilly, but I guess I can't complain. <laughs> yes, it's freezing here. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. So um, I guess I want to start out by an introduction, give you all a chance to say, well, how you got started individually in the music, how you met, and just whatever you want to share to let the people know what you're working with and how it started. After you. Ladies first. Well, well we, we met a very long time ago. Uh, I want to say about 35 years. Approximately. Approximately. Yes, yeah. In a roller skating rink. <laughs> yeah. I used to belong to an entertainment company called The Good Skate, mm -hmm. um, managed by Bill Butler. And um, so I was doing shows here and there and Ben came across me. We were introduced by, by my god brother, actually, but yeah. that was a long time ago. We were little babies. <laughs> <laughs> yes. so. I, I, think I, saw, I think I saw your wedding picture, actually, a while ago on Facebook. Y'all did, did look young, but time has been good. Y'all still look great. We're well, trying. We're trying to power <laughs> age. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Stay healthy and, and get exercise and, and all of that. And eat right as you do. You know? Yes. Yes. That's good. That's good. Yes. So that was a long time ago. Um, but prior to that, really all my life, I've played um, some kind of stringed instrument. When I mm. was very small, like pre-kindergarten, I had a uke that I used to pick out little songs on that I taught myself. And when I got a little bigger, I had saved my allowance, which was 25 cents a week. Ooh. And I saved it for a long time to buy my first guitar, which was, I remember it, it was $19.99. And I still have it. Wow, okay. I still have it. Um, but that, that was a, a good while ago, but I was, you know, teaching myself by ear um, a little later into it, my parents sent me for music lessons, mm -hmm. which I absolutely hated. Um, I, I just could never really get the hang of reading standard notation. I can do it, but by the time I figure out what note it is and where and transfer that to the fretboard and, and play it, the moment has passed. Yeah. You know? So I, I can read tablature extremely well, but standard notation just never agreed with me. And there was a point where my mother, she was a school teacher mm -hmm. and she paid the music teacher in her school to come over on Saturday mornings. His name was Mr. Anderson. And he would get $5 and all he could eat breakfast to sit there and teach me things. and. One of the things that he started me on was how to play by, by ear. And mm -hmm. that was much, that went so much better for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I explored classical music, folk music, rock and roll. It, it was all fun for my fingers, but it didn't really grab me. Yeah. You know, and then I came across the music of Mississippi John Hurt through an album that was in my school's music library. Mm -hmm. And I went there every single day that I had school to listen to that album. They stopped putting it away because they knew that I was going to show up and ask to hear that album. Here and I wore come. it out. Here she come. <laughs> I wore it out. And uh, my brother uh, bought me my own ver my own copy of it. Uh -huh. which I still have. And then I could play it at home day and night, night and day, drive okay. everyone crazy. I'd listen. And then I'd try to repeat, listen, repeat, listen, repeat. So I came up with my own crazy versions of 
uh, all of his songs on that album, the fingering was all backwards, everything was wrong. Um, and then I found eventually a teacher here in New York City, Jack Baker, who straightened out all that fingering. And I think that was, that set me on a good path. Uh, he, he's the one that taught me how to read tablature and, um, and, and from there, you know, it, it was a very twisted path. Um, but Ben, tell them how, how you got started. I'm just <laughs> rambling here. Mm, yeah. <clears throat> well, I got started playing this music, of course, because of Valerie. Over the years, I listened to her playing this beautiful music. And, um, and I tried to um, play a little bit of harmonica. She started leaving instruments around the house actually, <clears throat> because she was encouraging me to, to play one. And um, one day I came back uh, from Vermont with a, a washboard. As, as a joke, I said, well, you've been trying to get me to play an instrument. This is what I'm going to play. <laughs> but it, what she did was she said, OK, that's fine. Um, go on YouTube, look up Blue's washboard, and figure it out. <laughs> and, and the very next week, Valerie had me at an open mic playing the washboard. Ah. Yes. <laughs> Trial by fire. <laughs> just yeah, just jump in. <laughs> yes. You'll never wow. see those people again. <laughs> yes. And then soon after that, um, you were the coordinator at um, in on the West Coast for the blues um, series there. At Centrum. At Centrum. Fort Townsend. Yes, and you had uh, Newman Baker Taylor. Newman Taylor. Newman Baker. Taylor Baker. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, I I took his class and uh, to find out that he lived right here in New York City. So uh, it was a pleasure meeting the Ebony Hildelies there, and yes. um, you know, I I learned during the week from him, and. Um, between he and also um, Washboard Chaz, I created yeah. my own very interesting style from mm -hmm. both of theirs and, uh, you know, and went from there. Wow. What but, a you know, I want to point out something. You brought up a good point, Ben, that um, Corey Harris, he was the artistic director yes. at the Port Townsend Blues Week that, that, at that time. But Corey has been a little ray of, of sunlight at different strategic points in our journey. Um, I, will, I love to tell people the story about how <laughs> we were driving along the West Side Highway one Saturday or Sunday afternoon. That's a, a road in New York City for those who aren't familiar with it. And it's right up against um, the Hudson River. The pier, yeah. And yeah. on that particular day, my ear heard something. We're driving along <laughs> and I heard something. And I said, stop the car. <laughs> I have to investigate this sound. Mm -hmm. I rolled down the window and I heard the most beautiful music. Like it touched me very deeply. Mm. I got out of the car on the highway. She jumped out of the car. And I left, I left Ben. <laughs> I said, you'll find me over <clears throat> there. Uh -huh. And over there was this pier where there was a concert going on and who was sitting on that stage? It was you, <laughs> it was you. And you were sitting there, you, you weren't with your band, you were solo. Uh, I remember you were very colorful and you weren't facing the audience. Mm -hmm. You were facing um, south, looking mm -hmm. downtown, and the audience was seeing you from the side, and you were just playing the most beautiful music that my ears had ever heard. And I got closer to the stage, closer to the stage, closer to the stage. 
I wasn't even worrying about Ben and whether he could find me. <laughs> you know, wh where was he going to park? You know, where was he going to go? <laughs> he did find me though, but yeah. I crept up as close yeah. to you as I could possibly get. And I just soaked in all of that music. And that was the first wow. time that I had heard about you. And it reignited my interest in playing guitar because that's something that I had been putting down and picking up, putting down and picking up, depending on school and work and different yeah. things that happen in, in your life. Yeah. But I never put it down again after that day. It's a fact. It's a fact. So <laughs> thank you. That. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> I remember playing. Um, that was at the pier. They had like some, that's where they had the warships kind of right there. Yes. yes. Yes, I remember that day, as a matter of fact. Yes. Sapphire was there also. Jim. Yes. Uh, Candy Cane was there. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. It, it, was a, it was a great day. Uh -huh. <laughs> wow. We go way back. <laughs> yeah, we go way back. <laughs> That's beautiful. So, um, and you're both New Yorkers? No. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. Ah, that's right. Okay. okay. Home of the steel pan. Ah, so you played steel pan coming up? No, I didn't. But, uh -huh. um, you know, I, I just jumped in when yeah. uh, Valerie uh, wanted me to play a little music with her. We do have a steel pan, though. Um, when we went to visit some of his family in Trinidad, yeah. it's something that we brought back with us. Yeah. Uh-huh. A concert tuned uh, steel pan that can play any kind of music. When we want to wake up the neighbors, <clears throat> we just beat all yeah. over it. Uh huh. Wow, I love the sound of steel pan. That's yeah. that it also is a great, as you know, uh, very long tradition. Yes. yes, yes, it actually comes from the town that I'm from in mm. uh, Port of Spain, Trinidad. Oh, okay, that's the capital, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. That <clears throat> steel pan was outlawed at one time, wasn't it? Um, I don't remember exactly, but mm -hmm. it may have I think it was. Yeah. I think it's one of the one of the many cruel things that have happened over time. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow, that's fascinating. I remember hearing something about how the steel pan is connected to the oil industry in Trinidad. Yes, yes, it definitely is. Uh -huh. Those were the drums that uh, held all of the, you know, the oil. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Have, have you all played down in Trinidad? No, we haven't. Wow. Not as yet. <laughs> not yet, not yet. Not yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So after that first uh, open mic, after you started jumping in and swimming, where did it take you after that? What was your, what's your, what's your story after that first open mic? Well, as I said, I, you know, came to the, um, to take classes with uh, Newman Taylor Baker because Valerie was also there. And, you know, from that experience, I started experimenting, uh, listening to the music that Valerie uh, was playing and tried to, to chime in and uh, mesh the sounds. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been told that, uh, that it, it works nicely. I just have, you know, a subtle touch mm -hmm. that, you know, creates that um, beautiful sound. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, well, I can attest to that. That's the yes. truth. Thank you. And from that, I also started um, playing <clears throat> a little bones. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, there's a man at the Archie Edwards Blues Heritage Foundation by the name of Jim, Jim Land. You mm. may know him. Um, he keeps the tradition of creating these beautiful wooden bones. Ooh. And um, I've been studying with him on creating these wonderful bones, you know, from um, carving them out to, you know, the finishing touches. Mm. And it's, it's a beautiful instrument, the bones. 
also. Wow. Well, I can't wait to hear that later on. That's going to be nice. Yeah. Hmm. And what is the history of, of Bones? Do, can you tell us a little bit about that? Because we've, you know, you hear that going back to the 1920s, I know, at least in my experience, I've heard it on records. Well, um, the Bones have been around, <laughs> um, you know, forever, just like um, since, uh, you know, Africans were enslaved and brought to the new world, as we call it, um, uh, we had, we, we brought our music with us. And although we weren't able to bring drums with us and play those, whatever we found around the home, whether it be pots and pans, mm -hmm. um, bones, um, and, uh, you know, a wash tub, which, you know, became a, a upright base, the washboard, which became a drum, basically. Um, you know, and, and, you know, so the bones have been around, um, I'm sure, you know, before that in Africa and other places. Uh, but uh, their bones were originally uh, made of the um, rib bone of a cow or a bison or any large animals, even horse bones. Mm -hmm. And um, they were placed together and just created beautiful uh, rhythms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Ooh. Wow. I'm getting inspired now. I need to get me some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I know that you, um, Valerie, have had an association for a long time with Mr. John Cephas. Can you talk about that and how that began? Well, it began uh, the day that I heard you on the pier because I went home that night and I decided I needed some, some help. I taught myself all that I thought that I could. And I thought it would be great if I had a little direction. And so I did a search on Google for blues guitar teacher. Mm -hmm. And among the many names that came up, there was someone named John Cephas and I listened to audio samples of everyone that had come up in my search results. And of all the people I listened to, I was the most drawn to Mr. Cephas. Yes. So I tried to find a way to email him and it was very difficult. His email address was literally buried within his website somewhere and in his mangled website. Mm -hmm. And so I emailed him and uh, this was without doing any research. I, you know, a smarter person might have researched to see who was this person, but I didn't. I just emailed him. I said, hey, Mr. Cephas, <laughs> you yeah. sound pretty good. Yeah. Um, I'd like to learn what, how you play. Would you be willing to teach me? I live in New York. Yeah. He wrote back and he said, I'd be happy to teach you but I live in Virginia. And he said, what I want you to do is to register for a class that I'll be teaching. I'll be teaching at a workshop in New York uh, at Columbia University. It's called International Guitar Seminars. Mm -hmm. He said, you go register for that and I'll meet you there. Mm -hmm. And this I remember was in November. It was right around Thanksgiving because he and I were wishing each other happy Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And the seminar wasn't until like the following May or June. And um, I ended up registering. I showed up. Um, I was surprised because I thought that it was a blues workshop uh, I thought that there would be more African-Americans there. I thought that there would be a mixture of men and women there. I was the only woman there. I was the only black student there. And the only other African-American present was Mr. Cephas. 
So it was just kind of a surprise. It wasn't what I had expected. Um, but I had come there to study with John Cephas. Mm -hmm. So um, I introduced myself to him. I said, hey, I'm Valerie from the internet. <laughs> And he's like, oh, Valerie, I'm sure he didn't even remember that email exchange, but he played it off. He's like, oh, Valerie from the internet, so glad to have you here. Uh -huh. And from that moment, we became really good friends. Yeah. And uh, I would go to whatever workshops that he was teaching. He was at Port Townsend a couple of times. And one of those times he arranged for me to have a scholarship to go there, uh, which, which was wonderful. Um, so I would see him at different workshops. We also started visiting him at his home mm -hmm. in, in Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, he would often have different people come over and kind of like have a, a, a musical day where we'd mm. share food and share songs. And he'd always teach a couple of things or ask other people to teach him what they were doing. Mm. And he was very generous and kind yes. Yes. in that way. He is uh, one of the, the biggest inspirations for me musically. Uh, of course, Mississippi John Hurt, who started it, mm -hmm. you who reignited it, <laughs> and then John Cephas who uh, carried that through. And I've had many other teachers uh, in between that have pushed me in different areas, whether they were teaching me um, different repertoire or um, music theory. One person that I would mention would be Woody Mann, mm -hmm. who's also in New York City. John sent me to Woody. He mm -hmm. said, um, you can't come to Virginia all the time and I mm -hmm. can't teach you every single minute. He said, but I do really want you to study with my friend, Woody Man, because mm -hmm. um, he has a lot that you can benefit from learning. Mm -hmm. And so I asked and he agreed to also be part of that journey. Wow. Yeah. That's great. As you know, yeah, right. as you know, he he was a student of the Reverend Gary Davis. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some ancestral transmission going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. wow, that's amazing. So um what are the major uh festivals and places you've played that, that stand out that really really were great memories for you? Well, everywhere is a great memory in its own way. Mm -hmm. But some standouts would probably be definitely the Chicago Blues Festival was yes, one. Yes. Um, I think we had done a tour in Israel some years ago, and that stands out just because it, it was just so unique because of where it was. Yeah. Uh, that stands out. Um, I think. Monaghan, Ireland. We Ireland. Did, uh, we, we did something in, in Monaghan, Ireland. There was like a whole weekend of mm -hmm. uh, shows that we did. That stands mm -hmm. out. Um, mm -hmm. I, I loved our time in, in Belgium. Yes. Mm, I remember when y'all were there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I loved... Um, Small tour also in Austria that we did. Yeah, that, that yeah. was also wonderful. Yeah. Um, but I think one of my favorite performances, and this was actually before Ben joined me, mm -hmm. um, was in Richmond, Virginia. Mm -hmm. uh, Phil Wiggins, who, Phil, Phil Wiggins, as you know, but maybe other people don't know, he is uh, an amazing harmonica player. And he was the other half of the Cephas and Wiggins duo. He played with John Cephas. And when John Cephas passed away in around 2009, mm -hmm. Phil became very present in our lives. Mm -hmm. And he's done a lot to, to help push us. And one of the things that he did was he invited me 
to perform at the Richmond Folk Festival oh, yes. on a stage that was um, giving tribute to um, John Cephas. Mm -hmm. It was like a tribute performance. And that's, I guess, why he asked me. Mm -hmm. And that was the first big stage that I remember being on. And we showed up a day early because I was very nervous about this event. And I wanted to see that stage in advance. I didn't just want to show up and be surprised by it. So we went there the evening before we were, I was supposed to play. And the stage manager was very kind. He let me put a chair on the stage and sit there. So I, I, I made myself comfortable. I looked out, I was like, okay, this is what it'll be like tomorrow. I can do this. Mm -hmm. And um, then the next day it was just filled with people. There were just people everywhere. So many of them, all these eyes and ears <laughs> looking and listening. And um, I thought I would be nervous and I wasn't. I loved it. I, lo I, I, I said to myself, all these people are here and they're looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. This is awesome. I should do more of this. And uh, that was the day that I, I loved. I, I began loving performing. Yeah. I loved how it felt when, when they hooked up all the sound and I could hear myself I'm like, wow, look at that sound. I can hear myself all the way over there and over there. And this is just incredible. Yes. And it's not to say that I don't sometimes still get nervous, but that day I learned that uh, it was something that I was going to enjoy. Mm -hmm. Wow. Who are some of the, um, the women who have influenced you? We know there's a long tradition of great guitar players. Who are, yes. who are some that stand out for you? Well, I'm going to start with Elizabeth Cotton. Yes. She's one. Then there's, of course, for me, Etta Baker. Mm -hmm. Plays in you know same style. Uh, Memphis Minnie is someone that I absolutely adore. Um, I also love Gishi Wiley. Yes. Um, it's she didn't leave behind many recordings, so I'm limited as to what I can hear of hers. But her music just absolutely fascinates me. Mm -hmm. um, Let's see. I, I think those are the main women that that I I look to that that mm -hmm. influence me. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes when I hear you, I'm reminded of Precious Bryant as well. Uh, thank you. I do like Precious Bryant. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Were you about to say something, brother? Oh, oh! I was going to say recently, Valerie uh, wrote an article on women of the blues and you yeah this, share that with this is in the this is the current issue of acoustic guitar magazine uh -huh. and they contacted me just out of the blue and asked me to write an article about early blues women mm -hmm. that had been influential um specifically blues women that played guitar mm -hmm. so i wrote the article and highlighted um, some of my favorites, uh, Gishi Wiley, I, I uh, included Flora Moulton, Precious mm -hmm. Bryant was mentioned in there, um, Aljamae Hinton, mm -hmm. and Etta Baker was the mm -hmm. other one. Mm -hmm. um, these, these women are often overlooked and uh, or, or not not overlooked, but not quite as much attention is generally given to women as it is to to, to the gentlemen of, yes. of the blues. So yes. it was um, a breath of fresh air to me to be asked to write such an article. Mm -hmm. And it ended yeah, up mm -hmm. being, being their, their feature article. So that's even better. I was really happy to see that, you know, that was really exciting for me to see. I haven't read it yet. Can I read it online? Yes. I will okay. I'll make sure that I send you personally a link to it. Okay, good. I'll look out for that. Yeah, it's interesting how you it's true what you say that the focus has 
mostly been on the men playing, um, especially since from things I've read in the past, since the end of the 1920s. Because as we know, the first popular blue stars were women like Ma Rainey, Bessie Smith, and then somewhere around the late 20s, maybe it had something to do with the, with the depression, I'm not sure, but blues singing women seemed to fall out of favor. And there was a lot of focus on the men. Do you have any uh, understanding as to why that might've been? I do not know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I admit I have not researched that particular point. Mm -hmm. But it is a good point that, that you raise. And after we finish today's chat, you can be sure I'm going to be looking into that. Because mm -hmm. now I'm curious. As yeah, to, I'm, I'm wondering to, too. Why? And it's a great testament too to, to Memphis Minnie because she kept on going all the way into the 1950s. It's amazing. Yeah, she's absolutely one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Well, um, you know, like they say, um, talking about music is like dancing about art. So maybe y'all could play a song for us. We certainly would love to. And in fact, uh, we had planned to play something for you that is, um, I think Memphis Minnie wrote the lyrics, but her third husband, Ernest Lawler, wrote the music to this song. Uh-huh. Oh, this there's my guitar that I love. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much my only guitar these days. I love that thing. You know, I have a bunch of guitars, but most of them are too big or too something or another. This is the one that I always go to. So and who made that guitar before you started? Yeah, uh, Ron Phillips. He's a, a luthier in California and he makes a handful of guitars every year. If somebody's interested in one, they do well to get on his list ASAP because he's a busy man. <laughs> he's a busy man. Um, he didn't build this one for me personally. Uh, when I had uh, become interested in his instrument, he had such a, a long waiting list that I would still be waiting today <laughs> if I were waiting on that list. Yeah. Um, he came across this guitar being sold secondhand and he emailed mm -hmm. me and said, hey, what I would have built for you, you can get it, uh, you can get it today. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so I got it today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. It was waiting for her in uh, North Carolina, I think yep. it was. Okay, all right. <laughs> so, um, all right, so there's a song that it's kind of funny. John Cephas used to, he taught me this song. It's called Black Rat Swing. Okay. And that's that song that <clears throat> Ernest Lawler wrote and Memphis Minnie wrote the lyrics to. Um, but he would teach me the song and the next time he'd see me he'd say all right let's play black rat swing Valerie yeah, you know let's let's go and I couldn't do it I couldn't do it and so we'd start from the beginning each and every time this went on for longer than it should have and eventually he passed away but right after he passed away I started playing it wow there you yeah go. so yeah so here it is black rat swing let me hear the harp
That's right. That's right. I can hear the applause. <laughs> Thank you. I love it. I love it. I love it. I can hear that that Mr. Cephas ringing through. That golden green sound is there. So do you have Virginia roots in your family? I do. Um, my There's two sides, of course, to my family. My father's people come from Georgia. Okay, they're, they're mm -hmm. from Georgia. My mother's family, which I only discovered very recently through DNA, uh, mm -hmm. they are from Virginia and North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So um, there was a you know whole big mystery and mix up on on her side, um, but I'd always known that they were from the Virginia area because of her birth certificate, which I had. Mm -hmm. A lot of information on there was false, but mm -hmm. that particular point was was not false. Mm -hmm. um, so the Virginia and North Carolina regions are where her family's from. There's a whole lot of them too. And your dad was from Georgia, so you had the yeah. I have, I have the whole Piedmont, Piedmont region, region. <laughs> in case from blood. top to bottom. In the blood, yeah, it comes through in the sound. It definitely does. Wow. So, um, you know, a lot of people who are watching this, I'm sure, may be familiar with the blues generally. But when we say Piedmont, what are we talking about? When so, just so the people know. Yeah, that is the region along the east coast of the United States from roughly Virginia down through Georgia. Um, so when people talk about Piedmont blues, it can mean several things. It can mean music that comes from that region, or it could mean music played by a person that comes from that region, mm -hmm. or it could it commonly refers to a style of finger picking, which is characterized by an alternating bass played by the thumb. That's what I was just doing with Black Rat Swing. You've got that, that steady bass line happening. And on top of that is layered a syncopated melody played by the remaining fingers. And that's the style that I play in it's the style that John Cephas played in. It's the style that Etta Baker played in. Mm -hmm. um, it's the, the style that Mississippi John Hurt played in. Now that, and that's an interesting case. See, that's a case where someone is playing in that style, but they are from the Mississippi Delta. Yeah. So his peers were most likely a lot of them playing in the Delta blues tradition. And he was mainly playing in this East Coast style of finger picking. So mm -hmm. when you hear about the Piedmont style, it's not limited to someone from the Piedmont region. It, it travels like everything else. True, true. Yeah, he was definitely uh, unique in that aspect. I can only think of um, one other player from Mississippi who didn't sound like he was a Mississippian was Hacksaw Harney. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hacksaw <clears throat> Harney was, was very dangerous on the guitar. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. And I, I wonder how that turned out. Do you think um, John Hurt was listening to records and got that sound or how did that start with him? I wonder. Well, it could happen through, I think, people passing through because mm. people have a misconception that musicians are like trees, like they get planted in a spot and they never move for a hundred years. But the fact is musicians travel around. Yeah. And I believe that he must have had people that passed through his area, mm -hmm. you know, that played in that style, or he may have had a relative that traveled somewhere and came back and brought that style with them. Mm -hmm. But music travels. Yes, yes. And, and to me, the best way that it travels is by, a, uh, you know, it, it travels 
in person. You, you learn when someone's sitting in front of you and you're watching them and you're hearing it firsthand. Yeah. And then it, it touches you deeply and you say, well, I'm going to try and do that. Mm -hmm. So I think he must have encountered uh, one or more people playing in that Piedmont style. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes good sense. Mm -hmm. For it to have impressed him so deeply that that became his style of playing. Mm -hmm. Wow! It wasn't just some casual thing that passed through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point you say, you know, because when we, when we think about the blues nowadays and the scene that is there or that was before COVID, you know, um, you know, it's a lot of these big festivals and things, but a lot of this was under the radar for so long of the so-called mainstream. And yeah, I like the point that you make about musicians, they assume we're like trees, but yeah, we <laughs> definitely get around, you know, we definitely get around. It makes me think of uh, Mr. Cephas when I found out that he played Skip James. I was like, wow, he's from Virginia. You know, like, mm -hmm. not that he can't, but it was just like, wow, that's amazing to me, you know? But, you know, if this is all one music with different little branches, you know, but it all communicates so well with each other. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. it, it was in him to play that. And I, I loved how he would how he and Phil would uh, organize their shows. They would, if they had two sets, the first half would always be a uh, Piedmont style, that upbeat, bouncy stuff. And then they take a break and they come back and hit you with Skip James for a half an hour. Yeah, yeah. He was one of the foremost modern proponents of Skip James. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what I really appreciated about him. He had years. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, um, also, when I listen to you play, I'm reminded also of John Jackson. Were you ever able to run across Mr. Jackson? Mm -hmm. Sadly, no. By the time I came out of my little shell of privacy <laughs> and uh, was interacting with people down in that region, he had passed away. Uh -huh. And I certainly would have loved uh, to meet him. I think I would have enjoyed that a lot. There's so many people that, that I missed out on yeah. and it's, it's sad. Yeah, yeah, you know, coming from uh, Virginia, you know, I wasn't born there, but I lived there for so many years. I would see Mr. Jackson quite regularly. He would come to Charlottesville because, um, you know, Fairfax isn't that far away. And um, one of my first, really wasn't a gig, but someone just had said, hey, John Jackson's playing. You want to play out in front of the, of the theater, you know, to warm the people up. So that's what I did, you know, and he came by and he listened for a little bit. And I was real rough. I was just getting started, you know. And then um, a couple of years later, I had a gig with him at a place called Swallow Hill Music Hall in Denver, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And uh, we shared a bill and he, uh, my mother was there and I was just so happy that he could hang with my mom, you know, and he had a little flask of something strong to drink, <laughs> you know, with me. <laughs> and um, he told me then, he says, yeah, I remember, I remember you because I saw you playing out in front of the theater in Charlottesville and, you know, he was kind. He said something like, you know, you were still getting it together, but now you, you, you want something now, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that made me feel good. Yeah, I love John Jackson. Are you familiar with Jeff Scott by any chance? Yes. Um, we met Jeff. He was part of that uh, tribute to, to John Cephas that... I had mentioned I'd done in Richmond. Um, we had met Jeff in Port Townsend. I, it may have been the year that we were there when you were the artistic director. Did you bring Jeff out there? I did, yeah. Okay, then that's when we first met him. But then mm -hmm. we saw him again at that festival. 
Wow. Yeah, that's uh, the nephew of, am I correct? That's the nephew of uh, John Jackson. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. That's right. And he has got so many great stories about, I wish that more people were aware of, of him, but um, I guess fortunately and unfortunately, he um, didn't put a, his whole career in music. He, you know, as you know, did other things. And so, you know, he was a, a farmer, an insurance agent. He was a state trooper for a long time, you know, so, and of, of course, as musicians, we can understand the, the lure of a steady income, you know, but um, yeah, more, more people need to know about Jeff Scott because when you hear him play, it's like being with John Jackson, he's got the hat, he's got the bolo tie. <laughs> yes. He doesn't talk just like Mr. Jackson, but if you ask him to, he can go right into that accent, like, boom, you no. Know? So, wow. Hmm. Yeah, it, it was a joy to meet him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what has it been like for you all managing Piedmont Blues during the time of COVID? Well, we, we had, had a, a really nice year planned in 2020 and like everyone else it got canceled but i'll tell you it was one of the best years that we had ever had on the books mm -hmm. and everything just evaporated um and we were sitting around one day trying to think well how do we keep in touch with people how do we stay relevant what do we do yeah. And we came up with the idea to create a digital venue. Mm -hmm. And so we created the Piedmont Blues Cafe, mm -hmm. which we live stream from on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, during the height of COVID, we were streaming every Friday. It was mm -hmm. called Friday, Friday Morning Live mm -hmm. at the Piedmont Blues Cafe. Mm -hmm. And uh now that many people have started going back to work mm -hmm. um we've cut back our schedule so that we just do a monthly stream we moved it to sundays when many people are home so now mm -hmm. it's sunday brunch live <laughs> from the piedmont blues cafe so that that's one of the things that we're doing um where getting a lot of requests for videos for different venues or different events. Um, people will contact us and say, can, can you give us a 30 minute video that will stream as part of this or that concert that they're uh, putting together. Yeah, and we're also doing some live stream. And we and shows. as well as some yeah. live stream concerts that go through Zoom or some other platform that people choose. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's this weird mm -hmm. combination of, of digital things. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't been easy because, you know, you have to get used to the fact that there's no audience. I mean, it, that's not true. There is an audience, but you can't see them. You can't hear them. You don't know they're there. You don't know if they're walking away because they got uh, a phone call or if they are clapping because they enjoyed what you did. You don't, you can't really gauge too much about their reaction to what you're doing. And so you just have to kind of blindly just keep pushing forward. And to me, it's a lot like radio. I used to run my school's radio station. And one of the things you have to always be aware of is you can't have dead air. Yeah. You, you can't have silence. And so it's like you, you play a song and you can't just sit there like you normally would because you got to give people a, a 30 seconds to clap. You got to come back with something to say. And it has to be continuous. It can never stop. This continuous stream of blah, 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 music, <laughs> blah, 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 music. And then, and you don't know how it's being received. It's weird. Unless it's on Zoom. If Unless it's on, it's Zoom, on Zoom, then you, you can the... see some people. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's bizarre, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, um, well, before we, we continue on, we just, I just have a few more questions, but I want to, invite all the listeners to please like share and subscribe on this channel so we can 
continue to spread the word about all the great guests we've been having. And um, also I want you all to let the people know where can they find you, your platform addresses online. Uh, our, our website is Piedmont Blues and that's blues spelled with a Z, P-I-E-D-M-O-N-T-B-L-U-Z.com. That's our website and anything you need to know about us, you can find that information there. You can you, follow us on Facebook. We're also on Facebook. Yeah. yeah so. uh, and you can certainly visit our live streaming venue, the Piedmont Blues Cafe, which is on Facebook. Um, but the easiest thing is to go to our website and that will link you to everything else. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm. So what, uh, what are the musicians that you've been listening to when you're not playing? Who do you listen to? I listen a lot to Cephas and Wiggins. Yeah. A whole lot. Uh, they have one particular CD that I enjoy, which is Masters of the Piedmont Blues. Mm -hmm. And I will listen to that. I can listen to that all day in a loop. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I also love listening to someone named Corey Harris. <laughs> and I think I have all of your CDs. Wow. I'm pretty sure that I do. I love that sound. And uh, Bill, I love Bill Brunzi also. Ben loves Big listening Bill. to Big Bill. <laughs> yeah. um, I listen a tremendous amount to um, Mississippi John Hurt. Uh -huh. <laughs> ah, look, there's Big it's Bill good, right there. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so for me, be, between just a small handful. I, I try to limit what goes into my ears because I'm very impressionable. Uh -huh. And if I hear something, I want to dig deeper and deeper and deeper. So you would just not have enough time. One of the downsides for musicians today is that we have access to so much, uh -huh. whether it's audio or video there, there's just so much coming at you. And I like to filter most of that out, mm -hmm. most of it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I will listen to just the people whose music really catches my ear. I will listen to Taj Mahal. I will listen to Corey Harris. I will listen to Kev Mo. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, Cephas and Wiggins, John Hurt. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a small cluster yeah and then as I'm digging deeper it may lead me to other recordings mm -hmm. of other people and then I'll dig a little deeper there I listen a lot to Memphis Mini yeah um, and I listen to Gishi Wiley mm -hmm. I, I have like a little playlist that mm -hmm. it just randomly plays whatever I've I've put into my uh, into my little iPod and mm -hmm. that's what's in there. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I'll listen to uh, Warner Williams. Yes. I yes. love Warner Williams and, and Jay Summerauer. Summerauer, yes. Now that that's that's some serious Piedmont style playing. So no. Uh, and actually, Jay Summera, we, we had gone to see them play a show. I think it was um, maybe in Virginia or Maryland. But um, I, I saw Jay Summera playing a washboard. And that that's part of what encouraged me to play it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what was amazing when you were the artistic director in Port Townsend, you brought together an incredible group of blues musicians and teachers that we wouldn't normally see or or even know of mm -hmm. so these were a lot of elders who played this music and and they were gems and it was just a pleasure and thank you so much for doing that <laughs> yeah it was my pleasure yeah and that's when i had gotten my start is when mm -hmm. Um, I came to uh, Port Townsend. Wow. 
learning from from these masters you know wow that's great. amazing <laughs> hmm. i'm thinking of two new yorkers who also play in this style one who's left us is um larry johnson did you ever listen to larry johnson no yeah no he's got a record out called well it came out a long time ago called fast and funky but Larry played with, um, he studied under Mr. Davis, under Gary Davis for many years. Check him out. He's dangerous. I had heard about him, but I admit I, I've not dug into his music because I have that fear. All right. Mm -hmm. I recently started listening to Joe Calicott. Ah, yes. And see, that that's just opening Pandora's box for me. <laughs> Yeah, because there's all these new sounds that are coming into my ears, and that's why I have to stop. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love I love Joe Calicott, you know. And from what I understand, he really didn't have that much of a career. He recorded way back in the twenties, and then was like a a sharecropper for I don't know like forty years, something like that. And then George Mitchell recorded him like I think in like 67 or something and then he was gone by 69. So yeah, but Joe He has Calicott. the same birthday as me. Oh yeah, what day is that? October 10th. Okay. Different wow. years, but the same day. Wow, wow, check it out. And um, of course, I know you know your uh, other fellow New Yorker, Guy Davis. Oh wait, how could I forget? <laughs> I listened to Guy Davis too. He's in no. that iPod. He, yeah. There's no way he's not in there. I love, in yeah. fact, my favorite thing is to steal stuff from him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. He encouraged that. Yeah, well, he, he encouraged it. He, okay. he said, you know, to be a good musician, you've got to, you've got to learn to steal stuff from people. I'm like, okay, I'm going to start by stealing stuff from you. Yeah. And I've stolen so much from him. <laughs> so yeah, much. Guy. He's amazing. I love his sound. And he's another one where he's from New York, but that Piedmont, that Georgia sound is like so strong. You can't deny it. No, you, you cannot. Know. Yeah. See, it, it's hard for me. Like my, my, my hardest question to answer is who do you listen to? Because there's all these names that I forget, you know, I listen to, to more things than I guess I think I do, but mm -hmm. he's definitely in there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, um, would you gr uh, grace us with another tune? Sure. Okay. Um, this one, uh, this will be a, a traditional song that uh, is inspired by the playing of Mississippi John Hurt. Okay. Can, can uh, Benedict? Can you show us the the washboard so the people can see? Yes. This is not your average washboard. I'm an artist, so I create these interesting washboards as um, art and also uh, you can play it as an instrument. Oh. And yeah, so I, I build them for, for people who uh, would like to have an interesting washboard in their home. Okay. <laughs> I love that. Yes, I purchased bells from all over the world and, um, you know, add wood blocks, create wood blocks, add cans and, you know, just to have a variety of sounds, you know. So. <laughs> yes, all right then. I love it. Yes, I do too. So, so we're going to play a traditional song called Make Me a Pallet on Your Floor. Yes. Yeah. 
done i want to um thank you all i, I did want to get you to tell the people about your book and where they can find it yeah thank you so much for that uh, ben and i published this book it's called piedmont style country blues guitar basics it includes over 20 20 arrangements of um country blues songs that uh can teach you how to play in the style that you've heard today. Um, the book comes with an audio download of me playing each arrangement. So you, you have the tablature, there's standard notation, and you've got the audio download. And between those three things, um, you can really get started on that path if that's your interest. Wonderful. And they can get that where? On your website? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. yes. You you can only get it from us. <laughs> and uh, the details for that are on piedmontblues.com. We're very pleased that that book was acquired by the Library of Congress. And so yes. it's, it's there as well. And wow. um, it, it was a fun project. Wow. And you have uh, any other projects coming up that people should know about? 
Um, not too many. Um, ben is working on a book, but mm -hmm. I don't know if he's ready to talk about it. Or... Not ready to talk about it as yet, but you know, it's uh, uh, going to be about um, percussion um, from the year of this music. So it's mm -hmm. going to be, you know, uh, about the washboard, of course, uh, bones, and mm -hmm. you know, other percussion instruments like that. Wow! But you've well, got a book, um, Mr. Harris: Blues People, Legends of the Blues. Yes, yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so. Beautifully illustrated, I might add. Yeah, Thank I wonder you, who did those illustrations. <laughs> oh, it was you. <laughs> <laughs> Multi-talented, right? <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Wow. Well, family, I want to thank you all so very much for the time, for the inspiration, for the wonderful music. And um, yeah, I guess that's about it. Benedict and Valerie Turner with Piedmont Blues. Y'all catch them where you can. And of course, when COVID finishes, I'm sure they're going to be out there burning up the road and bringing the music to the masses. Yes. Thank you for well, thank having you us. Thank you for having us. It's been, been a, a pleasure speaking to you today. <laughs> thank you. I had a great time. Y'all be well. Yes, we will. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yes. Stay safe. You too. Stay warm. Yes. <laughs> that too. <laughs>